This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good evening, and welcome to this first lecture in the new academic year by the Walter H. Capps Center for the Study of Ethics, Religion, and Public Life. Thank you for coming. For those of you who do not know about us, the center was created in 2002 to honor the memory and legacy of Walter Capps longtime and popular professor here at UCSB. And then he became a United States Congressman. Aside from the sponsoring lectures such as this one here on campus and some we hold downtown, we offer five courses on ethics, internship programs in Santa Barbara, Washington DC and Sacramento. We have the CAPS Forum on Ethics here on campus three times a year, and we hold CAPS Conversations downtown. If you care to have your name added to our email list, if you don't already, uh, please sign our email list, and somewhere I think Kelly Coleman has that and will circulate it, and if you care to get notices about our programs and dates, we'd be delighted to have you added to that list. After the lecture, there will be some time for Q&A. Our speaker tonight is the legendary civil rights advocate, Morris Dees. After a successful business and then earning a law degree from the University of Alabama and practicing law in Montgomery, he co-founded the Southern Poverty Law Center in 1971 to handle lawsuits involving civil rights violations, domestic terrorism, and hate-motivated crimes. Since then, the center has successfully battled and dismantled a series of hate groups, including the Aryan Nation and the Ku Klux Klan and other white supremacist groups. He is known for his innovative lawsuits and securing huge criminal, civil, and financial judgments against hate groups. He has been described as, quote, his generation's most valiant and effective soldier in the fight for civil rights and civil liberties. He was named one of the 100 most influential lawyers in America by the National Law Journal in 2006. He's the author of A Season for Justice, Hate on Trial, The Case Against America's Most Dangerous Neo-Nazi, and Gathering Storm, America's Malicious Threat. He is the recipient of 20 honorary degrees and numerous awards, including the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Award from the National Education Association. In 1991, NBC aired a made-for-TV movie called Line of Fire about him and his legal victories against the Ku Klux Klan. Mr. Dees, as an American, and especially as a Southerner, I applaud you for all you've done for our country. <laughs> His
This topic tonight is with justice for all in a changing America. Please welcome Mr. Morris Dees. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for coming out tonight, and uh, I'm so glad to be back here. I was here 15 years ago. It seems like uh, uh, America's changed a lot in 15 years. But when I was here 15 years ago in California and far away from Alabama, um, I was thinking to myself, you know, what got me on this road to start with? And what took me from the cotton fields of Alabama to a place that here where now you don't even have any rain? <clears throat> and I, we got a lot of water. We could ship it to you. We'd love to. And I was thinking, you know, and I, was, and I, I told this story 15 years ago, and uh, I was asked to, to mention it again, and that I think, I think it was because I had a, I had a good mentor. Uh, little cotton farming community I grew up in, and rural Montgomery County. I went to a school that had about 50 students and several classes in the same room, four rooms in the school. And there was a teacher I had there that wanted to do her best to make sure that we grew up to be, to be good citizens. Not only was she my teacher in the third, fourth, and fifth grade in the same room there, she was also the Sunday school teacher at Little Baptist Church. And Honestly, the Bible verses were in school in the church at that time. There was no distinction in Mrs. Virabel Johnson's idea. And she said there was two things, if we want to be good citizens, that we couldn't do. And one was we couldn't smoke cigarettes. And the second was we couldn't drink alcoholic beverages. I did great on the first one. <laughs> and I promise you, if if all of you in this room had had Ms. Johnson, not a single one would ever smoke. And if America had had Ms. Johnson for a teacher, we wouldn't have any tobacco litigation. There wouldn't be any cigarettes. Because we had this, a little rhyme we had to say. And I was sitting there trying to think of it and told this story in so long. We had to say in that class that tobacco, she made us say, that tobacco is a filthy weed. And from the devil does proceed. <laughs> it picks your pockets and burns your clothes and makes a smokestack of your nose. <clears throat> but on this, on this uh, uh, drinking thing, she is much more serious. She had a button about this big around that she wore a lot of times fixed to her blouse. I know she got that during the prohibition battle because I'm sure she led the troops in Montgomery County trying to outlaw <laughs> drinking. And on this button it said, Lips that touch wine shall not touch mine. <laughs> she died an old maid. <laughs> and one day in class, I'm 12 years old now, 1948, and I'm the lawyer to be, you know, 12 years old. I'm sitting there, and she was going on with a temperance lesson in our schoolroom, and, and I saw a contradiction in what she was saying. I said, well, but Ms. Johnson, you told us last week that Jesus, in one of his miracles, turned water into wine. And she said, yes, Morris Dees, but we'd have thought a whole lot more of Jesus if he had not done that. <laughs> <laughs> but she, could, she would take us out in front of that little school with the rest of the teachers, and we'd stand by that rock road that ran by it, and, and we would raise the flag, and we'd pledge allegiance. And I remember so well with my hand on my heart saying that pledge, the words that have stuck with me ever since. One nation with liberty and justice for all. And it wasn't much that this little lady could do back then dealing with the segregation that we had in our community. But she said things that touched me. She, I grew up on a cotton farm, and segregation was the order of the day. My family didn't own any land. We just rented, and we were sharecroppers, so I had a chance to work with 
black people one on one. And she's, she said that, that I don't think we're treating our colored people, as they were called back then, fairly. Well, but long before I went to law school, it took another one of our Montgomery citizens, Rosa Parks, to refuse to give up her seat on the bus, and it took the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King to start a movement that would hopefully make the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, apply to all of us. A man who had to face many of his contemporaries who had little vision. He had to face legislators in Congress and in the states that had little backbone. And finally, he faced a terrorist with no conscience. And when Dr. King was making his famous speech in Washington, he said that there are lonely islands of poverty and injustice in this great American ocean of opportunity. And so many years after his death, there are still those who don't find opportunity and justice. And if Dr. King was here today, I think he would say that, and I think you would agree, that the march for justice continues on so many areas. And for those students here tonight and for you too, you have a front row seat in that march for justice. And you can sit on your seat and not do anything, or you can become involved. There's so many issues that we deal with at the Law Center, some we don't, some are national issues. Issues like the economic disparity in this country, which is rampant, where the top 5% of our population own 65 or 70%, I don't know the numbers of the wealth of this nation. People are suffering. We deal with issues like mass incarceration when our, your state is the, one of the largest ones that houses so many people that could be more efficiently and effectively handled in other ways than that. We have lawsuits dealing with that right now in several southern states that, that that's the order of the day. Issues like health care. We see a situation where there are people who control the economic and political power of this country don't think people who are different than them should have the benefits of health care, something that some of, most of you in this room probably take for granted. We have the big issue of LGBT rights. We know the Supreme Court ruled right recently on gay marriage. But across this country, those people that are involved in this community and those who are friends and loved ones know the bias and prejudice that exist. We just finished a case in New Jersey where we put a group out of business that says, give me $10,000 and I can turn your gay son straight. And we sued them. We sued, we sued them, we sued them uh, under the consumer fraud statutes of New Jersey, and the, and the, judge, and the judge put them out of business. We, we're dealing with this whole issue around our country today of police profiling innocent African-American men and others being, being shot by trigger-happy police officers. And most police officers in this country, 98% of them are fine people working hard, but there's a culture out there that causes them to to, uh, I guess, profile people in a way that causes them to take unnecessary violent action. You know, it just, it's, just so many, it's just so many issues. And I, I think the immigration, obviously, is a big issue, affects your state and other states. But I think the overriding problem that we have is the changing demographics of America. When I was in that class in 1948, at that little school, 15% of the people in the United States were people of color. Today, it's 36 or 7%. In this state, it's a majority. This state is far ahead of other states that way. And this changing demographics and, and, and what it portends for the next 20, 30 years, where people like myself and it appears to be most of you out there will be in a minority, is creating an enormous fear, a fear of, the, of those people who felt in some way that they are privileged, that, they, that certain things in this country belong to them because they're here, they're privileged, and they feel that people who are different than them, 
who maybe don't look like them should not share in the benefits of this nation. And you know, today you have politicians and we couldn't witness, couldn't be witnessing it in a better than right now, when we have the leading candidate in the Republican primaries who makes a statement outrageously that, first of all, all 11 million supposedly undocumented, he calls them illegals, should not be in this country and he would deport them all. He'd build a fence down across the border and I, if I could give him any advice, I would tell him to make that fence have a wide walking path on top because one day we might be able to get tourists to use it like to do in China. <laughs> You're not gonna reverse history. You're not gonna reverse history. And we know that the immigrants who are here today that people like Donald Trump and others don't want here are making this country work. They are making work, and you know here, they're doing so much work, so much good work. In our, in our area, they're they are processing all the poultry products, meat products, construction, uh, landscaping, on and on and on and on. People who have immigrant energy, this made this country great from the beginning. And this changing America has caused a tremendous uprise in hate groups especially when the face of America was a black president. We saw the number of hate groups quadruple up to around 1800, 1900, including the so-called so -called militia groups. And on the very night that Obama was inaugurated in Springfield, Massachusetts, an African-American church was burned by racists, a black church was burned in protest against him. When, we used to sue these hate groups, and I remember coming out here to California and suing Tom Metzger and his group for killing an Ethiopian up in, up in uh, Portland, Oregon. I remember at that time when I put on evidence in the courtroom up there that their, their reading material that they gave their people, their followers, uh, it was pretty bad stuff. But all you have to do is turn on the television today there's a network that I won't single them out, but its first letter starts with an F. <laughs> you get the same stuff right there. It's no different. We have mainstreamed hate in America, and it's because of this changing demographics. You know, I didn't, when I grew up on that cotton farm, I didn't have any understanding of diversity. We had the African Americans, the black people who worked in the fields and the white people that owned the land, and that was about it where I grew up. And as I said, my folks didn't own any land, so I didn't get a chance to, you know, I had to get out and work in the fields and I, you know, picked cotton with a sack on my back and all that growing up. So I got to, to deal with African Americans or black people as friends, and that's probably was my saving grace at that time. But I still didn't understand this whole idea of diversity and the issue that's, I think, front and center today in the, in the troubles that we're having in our gridlocks in our country, in our Congress especially, until I had a chance to represent a group of immigrants. The Southern Poverty Law Center lawyers and myself were called down to Houston, Texas, where some 50,000 Vietnamese had settled. Brought from the war in Vietnam, had they stayed behind, who knows what might have happened to them. Well, when they got there, they did exceptionally good. Many of them, they took over all kinds of businesses, hardworking people, fruit stands, restaurants, car wash places, mechanic shops, whole bunch of things. And a small group of them, about 50, decided that they wanted to go shrimping and fishing in Galveston Bay. And they didn't have the money to buy these two and three hundred thousand dollar boats and trawlers that the American fishermen had, and they were about 150 of those boats plying the waters in the Galveston Bay area. So these Vietnamese pooled their monies together and they bought these little small broken down boats that nobody would even take out. And they fixed these boats and went out to fish. And it wasn't long before they were out fishing the American fishermen. And there's no way to put it other than the American fishermen became jealous. And they went to the Texas legislature and said, pass a law that will not allow these people, these immigrants, to get fishing licenses. 
The Texas legislature in its wisdom said, we can't do that. These are our friends. This is a free enterprise country. Well, that didn't set well with a small group of these American fishermen. And so they turned to the, I guess, the world's oldest continuing terrorist group, the Ku Klux Klan. In this case, it was the Texas Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. And they decided that they were going to terrorize these Vietnamese, these 50 or so fishermen, so they'd be afraid to go out into the open waters on shrimping season. And they burned several of their boats. It's hard to prove who did it, but you can bet the Vietnamese didn't burn their hard-earned boats that they had to pay for. And they also burned a giant cross down at Kemer, Texas, where Clear Creek Channel comes out into the open waters, where the boats would come out into the open waters to fish. And this frightened the Vietnamese, and they put their boats up for sale. And that's where we got into the picture. A lawyer called us and asked if we could come help. And I remember getting there and meeting Nguyen Van Nam, the leader of the Vietnamese fishermen, wonderful man. And we walked up and down the dock in Kemer, Texas, and these Vietnamese boats were tied up at the dock, and they were rocking kind of in the water, and I could see the the little glass wheelhouses, you've seen these old out-of-date boats, and there's a for sale sign in the, in the window of these boats. It's the same kind of sign you buy at the hardware store. I said, you know, Nam, from my investigation, we can bring a civil lawsuit in federal court. He puzzled at that, and I said, well, you know, what that means is, is if we get the federal court to issue an injunction against these Klansmen and American fishermen, to not interfere with your rights, if they violate those rights, they go to prison for criminal contempt of court. So they agreed to let us go forward to the lawsuit. We had to rush quickly because the judge was looking for this preliminary injunction, and the judge gave us expedited everything. Shrimping season was open 10 days from the day we filed the lawsuit. And we found a lot of American fishermen who didn't like what was happening either. They had met these Vietnamese. They knew they were good people. They'd been in their homes. They knew they were hardworking, diligent people trying to better their lives. So I got some American fishermen to agree to testify that the Klan had come to them and said, if you, if you allow these Vietnamese to park their boats at your dock, we'll burn your dock. So they agreed to be witnesses. We were prepared to go to court. We had a good case. Court was going to start on Monday, and the shrimping season started the next Monday. And I got a call late at night from Mr. Van Nam. He said, drop the lawsuit. I said, oh, man, don't can't drop this lawsuit. We can win this case. He said, no, you've got to drop it because the leaders of the other Vietnamese businesses have said they let the Klan have the fishing. We're worried about our other businesses. I said, you know, Nam, it don't work that way. If you drop this lawsuit, they'll come after your other businesses. But if you tell me that you've got to drop the lawsuit, I've got to call the judge tonight and tell him we don't have a case. But could you give me an opportunity to speak to the Vietnamese people that are involved in this case and also some of the leaders in the community to talk to them about this case before I have to drop it? Because I don't think you should do this. Well, later that evening, about 7 o'clock, I was in a small Catholic church that a priest there to interpret, and about 75 or 100 Vietnamese came there to listen, many with the same clothes they had worn this country in. Very patiently dignified people listened. I said, you know, folks, don't drop your lawsuit because it's the worst mistake you can make is to cut and run in front of these bullies and cowards. And you know, America's a nation of laws, laws that protect the minority when the majority is breaking the law. Don't drop your lawsuit. He said, you know, there's another man y'all probably don't know, African-American man whose people's rights are violated, their churches are bombed, burned, people were shot. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was his name, and he led his people, and he used the courts time and time again and had they not used the justice system, they wouldn't have gotten their rights as soon as they did. Please don't drop your lawsuit. Well, I left that. It must have been a pretty contentious discussion because I saw fear in the eyes of these people's faces. 
I got a call later that night, and he said, Mr. Dees, continue the case. We got a, a, a trial for a week and put on good witnesses, and the FBI and others gave us good evidence and testimony. And the court issued a very powerful injunction in joining a group of group of uh, individuals in the Klan and American Fishermen Association from interfering with these Vietnamese. They were very happy with the injunction and invited me to come down to the blessing of the fleet. Customary. I got down there on Monday morning, about 5 o'clock at Kemo, Texas. There was a dock. When I got there, the sun hadn't come up. The fog was hanging heavy over the bay. It was just cracking light. And there was a Catholic priest there to bless the boats and about 50 or 75 family members sitting, standing there as their family members on their boats were going to come out into the open waters. Didn't hear any or see any boats until about 30 minutes later and I heard a diesel engine and a boat came out through the fog of the mouth of Clear Creek Channel and came by the dock there and the priest blessed that boat and another until 15 or 20 boats had gone out into the open waters. The sun began to burn through the fog as, as, he, as the sun came up there. And as I looked to my right and my left, I could see the sun glistening off the badges of the United States Marshals, who had been sent there to protect these people and to see that this court order was enforced. And as I looked around me at that, those family members, I could see enormous pride in their faces as they found a place at America's table. Not just finding a place at America's table, but building that table, so to speak, for the greatness of this nation like waves of immigrants have done in the past. And I'll tell you, as I stood there that morning, I not only felt proud to be an American, not only proud to be their lawyer, but proud to see the majesty of our American justice system at work. And for the first time in my life, I realized that America is great because of its diversity and not in spite of it. And as I have been thinking about that sense and seeing the, the rancor and ill feeling caused by the xenophobia that's in this current presidential election. It's saddening that the American public would buy into this. I was watching last night when Mr. Trump, who's a celebrity, and there's people want to come get the picture taken with him, and he was in South Carolina, and, and a reporter says to the man standing there, he says, well, Mr. Trump just said that if he was president, 9-11 wouldn't have happened. And what, what about it? He said, I would have had those illegals, they wouldn't be in this country. And asked this man who came to hear him, what do you think? And he says, well, if Trump says it, it's the truth. And you know, and I thought, oh my God. I mean, only two of those people who were involved in 9-11 were not supposed to be in this country. The other 21 of them were here legally. But facts don't seem to matter when you have a demagogue leading the pack. You know, I, the, the, our country is going to sort these issues out. I'm not sure how quickly, how fast, quicker, I hope, than later. But, but there, there, needs, there needs to be a, 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 I won't call it a spiritual, a, a religious, but this is an ethical lecture, an ethical change in our country. We need to change the hearts and minds of our people so they can slow down and pay attention to those people around them who may be different. I had an opportunity to, to represent a woman who taught me a very powerful lesson that I think applies to this nation. Her name was Beulah Mae Donald. She was an African-American woman who lost her son to a Klansman's noose in Mobile, Alabama. It wasn't just any Klan group. It was the United Klans of America, the group that bombed that church in Birmingham that killed those four little Sunday school girls. And down in Mobile at this time, there was a trial going on, a, a criminal trial. And in this trial, a black man was charged with killing a white police officer. 
And that didn't attract the Klan's attention. This Klan, by the way, had, had a revival. This is 1984. And they had chapters in 30 states, and they were growing big in, in, around the country. Uh, and, <clears throat> and they had watched this trial. But what concerned them was that the jury made, was made up of 11 African Americans in Mobile and one white. And they got together, and they said, look, if this black man, they didn't use that word, if he gets away with killing this police officer, we want you to find some black person and kill him in a way that the public will know that if blacks are going to sit on juries affecting the rights of white people, they better be careful. And they chose two young men, one guy who was 21 and one guy who was 17. A young guy was named James Knowles, and Henry was the old one. And they gave him a gun and a noose and a car, and they were all waiting in a room with the Klansmen when the jury's verdict came back on the television news that night. And it was a deadlock jury. It wasn't along racial lines, it turned out. And so they considered that a defeat. And so these guys went out looking for a black person, any black person. And they had given them a noose all fixed up, and they were ready to go. And they drove around about midnight. They came upon this young man who was walking along the street. It was Michael Donald, Mrs. Donald's only son. And he was a student at a uh, junior college studying brick masonry. And he was working in the Mobile newspaper, stuffing newspapers. And he was coming home from work. And they drove up beside him and asked him directions to a restaurant, and he gladly gave it to him. He was a very pleasant guy, the leader in his community, his church, real fine young man. And he didn't realize who they were, and they jumped out, put that gun in his face, and put him in the car. And as he drove, they drove him across the Bayou Bridge to a swamp over in an adjacent county. He was begging for his life. He said, please, take what money I have. Please, don't, don't harm me. My, my mama depends on me. Well, they took him over there, and they opened the car door, and he jumped out to run. They chased him down, hit him with a bat they had, and knocked him to the ground, and finally put that noose around his neck. And one of them got on one side of his face with his foot and the other, and they pulled on that rope till there was hardly no breath left in him. And they took him and then hung him in a tree in a black neighborhood where he's found the next morning. It took the FBI and others about three years to crack this case. And finally, this young Klansman had gotten in other trouble, and he ratted on his buddy. And he indicted the one who did the killing. And the guy who ratted on him got a life sentence in the witness protection program of, of the federal government. And they had a trial of that case. And I went to that trial because it was identified that these were members of the United Klans of America. And since I was a young man and saw that bombing a church in Birmingham, I really wanted to figure a way to get this group and put them out of business. So I went to the trial and as a lawyer for this family and working with their lawyer, local lawyer in Mobile, and, and Ms. Donald didn't come to this trial because it was too painful for her at that point. And that young man got up and testified what happened and the jury convicted the old Klansman and he got the death penalty. First time in the history of Alabama that we've been able to tell where he, white man got the death penalty for killing a black person. Well, after the trial was over, I asked the federal prosecutors if I might talk to this young Klansman, and I knew he didn't, they didn't do this on their own. And so I, he helped me, and we put together a case against the United Klans of America and sued them in federal court with the idea of showing that they had a whole history of violence, killing Vala on the march from Selma Montgomery, Birmingham the church in Birmingham, and so much more. And they have a pattern of violence, and they ought to be held liable as an organization the first time this legal theory <coughs> had been applied. So we, we ended up going to trial in Mobile, and the Klan had a very good lawyer. And I respected him for taking their case. Everybody needs a good lawyer. But I sued some of these individual Klansmen they had no lawyers, they had no money, but I wanted the jury to see the whole cast of characters. Ms. Donald came to that trial and she sat at the council table with us and we had an all white jury in the trial in Mobile. And I know that Mrs. Donald couldn't have helped but have seen the waffle boot prints in the autopsy photograph of her son 
as I passed it over to the jury. At the end of the trial, the Klan lawyer asked the jury not to rule against them because just because they're an unpopular group, these renegades did this without their approval. I thought we had proven quite differently. And I asked the jury to return a verdict so that one day when they call out the names of those men and women and children who died in the struggle for human dignity and human rights, that they'd call out the name of Michael Donnell. I sat down and the judge was beginning to tell the jury what the law was so they could apply it to the facts we had proven when this young Klansman, James Knowles, who was now in his mid-20s, jumped up. We didn't know what he was trying to do. He, the U.S. Marshals had brought him there from the prison. They grabbed him. And he asked the judge, he said, you know, judge, I didn't know that I could speak to the jury. And the judge says, well, son, you waited a bit late, but we agreed that he could speak. And he stood there in front of the jury and he, he said, you know, what Mr. D says is true. They taught us to commit acts of violence. Everything he's, the evidence is true in this case. And he said, I learned this that uh, my family and my community and my neighbors who uh, taught me this prejudice when I was young. He said, you know, I know I'll never get out of prison. I'll never be with my family again. And he looked at Ms. Donald sitting there at the end of our council table. She was five feet from the jury and he was standing in front of him. And he looked at her for a moment and he, and he started sobbing. I thought the judge was gonna declare recess so he could regain his composure when he cleared his throat. He looked down at her and he said, Ms. Donald, I hope you can forgive me for what I did to Michael. And she looked at him there, and I promise you if I try a hundred more cases, I'd never be as affected or moved. She said, son, I've already forgiven you. I thought the words that came out of her mouth was a higher justice than that $7 million verdict that jury rendered later that night. This woman who had lost one of the most precious things in her life, her son, had the mercy and the love and the understanding to know that this young man was a victim too. And from what she said there that night, to me is the lesson that this nation should embrace. And that is reconciliation. And as South Africa went through it when the leaders faced those they imprisoned, Mandela and de Klerk, and faced each other and had reconciliation. This nation has treated those among us who were not in power at the time in horrible ways, the internment of the Japanese, the mistreatment of the Chinese who came here and built the Sierra and went through the Sierra Nevadas and built the railroads and then told they couldn't be citizens, the Jews that came in here from Eastern Europe in the early 1900s and ended up having quotas slapped on them at colleges like Harvard and Yale and Princeton because they were successful in working hard and were not allowed to go to certain hotels and motels, and ads that were put against my people who came from Ireland and said that no Irish Catholic should apply for a job here. You know, we we've, we've have in many ways continued this horrible treatment by those of us who are in power against those who are powerless. And we're doing the same thing now with the immigrants from this country, especially those Latinos in this, in this nation. And it's gonna take a major change in the way we view ourselves and the people who are part of this great diverse nation. It's gonna take leadership from the top and the bottom. It's gonna take religious organizations, community groups, colleges, churches. It's gonna take uh, businesses, and it's gonna take politicians from Washington down to the county and city governments to create a culture of inclusiveness in this country. You know, when Dr. King was among us, he 
had serious doubts if this nation would continue. Why shouldn't they? Millions of African Americans are treated less than second class. And he, he, as he went around, and I heard him tell the story once, he told a story about another nation, a nation that was built on great promise, a nation that had, had actually failed to fulfill its promise, a nation about the Jewish people, it was about 900 BC who had been freed as slaves from Egypt and who had built this great city near the present site of Jerusalem. And <clears throat> it, it so happened that they had built a great city called a city-state then. As Dr. King told the story that you can find in, in the Bible, they built great walls around this city and, and they had good education system and banking and law enforcement and courts and had a great marketplace in the center of this town. And in this marketplace, people on the outside brought their products in to sell. And as they came in, one farmer in particular with his wagon loaded with produce for a stall in the market, waiting for those big gates to open, he saw things that bothered him. He saw able-bodied men and women begging for a few grains from his wagon. And upon inquiry, he learned that, well, <laughs> in this town, if you don't know the right people, if you're not part of the in crowd, you don't get a good job or a job at all to feed your family. And when he got in and put his stuff in the marketplace, he, he heard grumbling from the people walking by. And he heard them saying, well, if you, sometimes you get arrested because you're not in the right crowd, you don't have any power, and if you go to court, you don't get a good deal as the people who control this place. And this bothered this farmer because he knew, he knew what these people, these ex-slaves had been through that founded this great city, and he knew it was based on a promise of fair treatment. And he was a man of some means and from his community, and he asked if he could address the leaders of this town, like the city council, so to speak. And they gave him that opportunity. You know who this farmer was, I'm sure if you study this, he was the biblical prophet Amos. And Amos stood before these leaders of this ancient town and he said, you know folks, y'all got a good thing going here. But unless you're fair to all the people among you, you're not gonna get to keep what you have and pass it down to future generations. It's gonna be taken from you. And I predict unless you're fair, there won't be one stone left upon another of this ancient city or this city down the road. And he spoke to those people in the words that the Reverend Dr. King used in Washington in his famous speech. He says, people, don't be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and a righteousness like a mighty stream. Human rights begin close to home in our schools, in our communities, and in our workplaces. And that's where people seek equal and fair treatment. And if they don't find it in these places, then we'll look for vain, for progress in a larger world. This nation is at a crossroads. We've been there before. I have great faith that we're gonna overcome the negativity that we see today is going to be because people like you and the students of this great university and colleges and campuses all over this country will take a stand for justice in this changing America. Thank you so much for coming tonight. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I would like to learn from you too, and if you have questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, let me, while you're thinking about that, let me say, let me thank you for supporting the Southern Poverty Law Center. I know there are many of you here tonight 
who support our work. We have over 300,000 supporters that support our 250 employees, our 45 lawyers, our tolerance education program, our intelligence project, and so many other things that we're doing. But thank you so much. Yes, sir. It's very inspiring. I enjoyed it very much, Mr. Dees. Um, I'm looking at a handout that I'm sure you read. And on it, it talks about what you talked about. Justice for all will determine our nation's success in the next century. And then you mention the need to teach tolerance, love, respect for one another. Yes, Do you sir. know of any organization, people, institution that knows how to teach tolerance, respect, that knows the methods to be able to teach this? I agree with you, it starts in the family. Yes, sir. But how, who knows, by what method do you do that? Well, you know, if I had to answer your question, I probably would, I'd probably be president. But, <laughs> but, you know, we do our best, we do our best on those, but there are many other fine organizations that, that work on this, the uh, ADL, so many others, organizations, community groups around our country. And, uh, but I think it all starts with individuals, one-on-one. And uh, I wish I had a better answer for your question, but, but thank you for asking it. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for everything you've done for your illustrious career and for coming here tonight. I have to say that you have been one of my biggest heroes as far back as I can remember, and I've uh, happily supported the Southern Poverty Law Center for a very long time. Uh, two things that I wanted to run by you. One is I've always wondered about your safety. Most people, if they walk by a sleeping lion or tiger, will let it be. And you poke and prod and annoy those, those beasts. Uh, so I've always wondered about your safety and that of your colleagues. And uh, the other one is, uh, it seems, and you referred to the backlash and quadrupling of hate groups and, and all the events that, led rise, uh, that have given rise to the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, you just said you're not discouraged, but how can you not be? Not be what now? Discouraged by, okay. a, by, by what seems to be a backlash. Okay, well, you know, all lives matter, black lives particularly matter in this particular time. I've done cases against police brutality myself, the killing of a wonderful African-American by two policemen in Homa, Louisiana, and uh, hopefully that the cell phone generation with their videos are shining a new light on this whole subject. It isn't just something recently, we're just seeing it recently. On your, on your first question, uh, the threats and all that, now that bunch of folks been put in penitentiary for trying to harm me and they burned our building and down the Klan did. We caught the people that did it. And you know, it's, uh, we've had some wonderful support from law enforcement agencies. Uh, we don't live in J. Edgar Hoover's FBI days. The FBI today is quite different. We work very closely with them and Homeland Security and others fighting domestic terrorism, and they've alerted us to a lot of threats is important. But you know, we, we have a great support from our donors who provide us with terrific money for security, and you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a bit disarming to have people walk around your house at night, you know, security guards. Uh, you know, we have some pretty open windows and stuff like that, and, my wife and I can't do things on the pool table we used to do with them guards walking around. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, we, we do our best and uh, try, try to do our best. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, I came up here with one question, then I changed my mind. But, um, um, so I work for like an organization that fundraises for you. Work you work for what now? Telefund. We like fundraise for you. And we had a representative, um, Shannon, come in and talk to us about the SPL Center on campus. And I've kind of been trying to think about how to implement that because we have so many issues here with our police officers. And there's so many police officers with these big cars driving around and they don't really interact with us. And we recently had a student die because he had a cut in his arm, but when the police officers came, they didn't pay attention to the people talking to them because they were Hispanic. And I've had friends been pointed at and pointed at and laughed at because, you know, he was dressed flamboyantly. And I've had a friend 
with, you know, he's walking home with a group of his roommates who were girls and the cops stopped them and were like, you shouldn't be walking home with him. Mexicans are known rapists. So I don't really know in a situation like this how to use like Southern Poverty Law Center guidelines when it comes to working with law enforcement to make sure that students are represented as people and not just as criminals preemptively. But um, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of students and there are a lot of police officers and we could all work together instead of kind of being looked at like we're money to make the community better because I feel like tickets here probably are a big part of that, but yeah. Well, yes, ma'am, thank you for your, your statement there, but I'm not sure I heard your question. Um, you know, I don't hear too good. Come on, come on. Good. Okay. Yeah, just more kind of like, what, what can we do? Like, I know that Southern Poverty Law has like organizations on campus, but when there's this huge like disconnect between like the police officers and the students, I'm not even sure. Like, I feel like if I went into the foot patrol office and talked to them about this, I'd get arrested or something. It's not like a, yeah. I got it. <laughs> okay. Well, <clears throat> what can a student do about police profiling and especially in a campus situation? I know you've had an incident here on the campus. Uh, you know, I, I think on a campus situation, hopefully the administration would use this as a teaching example and would, would bring this issue in front of all the students and bring law enforcement together and, and try to come up with some cooperative solution. I don't know the specific facts of what you're talking about. I just heard about it. But uh, the, the law center doesn't have a project dealing with this at all. I've done some, tr some lawsuits against police officers, but we have, but we don't have a, uh, uh, a project dealing with this whole issue. Uh, there are other groups that do. And uh, you know, see me afterwards and I'll try to get you in touch with them. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yes. I have an observation. You know, uh, I, I travel a lot across this country by car and bus and train and plane, and I'm pretty old. And uh, I see everywhere towns that are drying up, just dying, you know, towns where I myself grew up and many others. And uh, then I see that uh, on my mother's side, great-great-grandfather came over and he was, uh, you know, was being shot at Napoleon and, uh, you know, the Prussians in Alsace-Lorraine, and they came to a little town, Napoleon, and uh, he, was a, he was a carpenter, but his son studied the law, became a prominent lawyer in a decent town in Indiana and was very constructive, the second generation, you know. And then it was true of my, I thought about it on my uh, father's side too, I think they were indentured from Ireland. They came and worked in starch factory and uh, came into the interior of the country. But then the children, they became prominent and they took these little towns and created them. We've got a lot of little towns here and there's a lot of people out there who want to come. Let's well, open the doors. Well, th thank you. And you know, you make an observation that's, that's, that's endemic to this nation, that is that so much of the things that people may produce in this country are not produced here anymore. Uh, the, the ship that was sunk recently in the storm, this merchant ship you probably saw, well, I read a story that the, the ship was 30 years old. It was an American-made ship, but they can't make merchant ships in America today. They've been made in Taiwan and China and Japan and other places because the labor cost is so high here in the, and the efficiency is not as good, but our Congress requires merchant ships from made in this country. But that was just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, a steel plant closed recently in uh, somewhere in Wisconsin, I can't think where it was, but on the front page of the New York Times, it showed steel being made in uh, you know, another country brought here. No matter what it is, maybe the things that we're making here is, uh, you know, uh, uh, movies that you can export and some high technology, but all the Apple cell phones that you buy and are not made in America. The technology might come from here. They're made in other places. And this is really destroying the middle class that's working in the country. You know, I, I'm not sure if this would be a solution, but I know Detroit, I know it pretty well. And Detroit was a city was built by the automobile industry and the workers were African Americans coming from the South who had no opportunities in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Now there are 25,000 empty houses that are deteriorating. And 
I, this, I'm just, I'm no economist, but it would seem to me that if you brought, like you say, if you fill those full of uh, people from other countries who, are, uh, who have this immigrant energy and, they, and you've put them in those houses, they'd fix them up. Well, exactly, and that's they, what they, they did. And they would create an economy, but I'm not, you know, that, that might make a lot of difference. When I started to work at 16 years old and got my first little check, there were 14 people working to pay my retirement in the Social Security. Today, I think it's 3.1 person for every retiree, and with 20 years from now, it'll be two people for one. You, you know, the system can't sustain that type of economies. But thank you for your observation. Yeah. Yeah. I, we got time for maybe two more questions, and we got to go. This is it. Yes, ma'am. Hi. My name is Michelle, and this summer I had an amazing opportunity to visit Alabama. I saw the sculptures of the four girls in Birmingham as they are perpetually playing in the park. I walked the bridge in Selma and visited many museums in uh, an opportunity to feel what it was like to be during the Civil Rights Movement. The most memorable experience of all was getting a tour of your offices. And Esther, who, when I, she found out I would be here tonight, said, I must meet you. So I don't have a question. I'm here to thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I was most impressed with all of the people I met. Um, anyone who wants to visit, I'll just let you know that finding out the actual uh, business that goes on, the things that you do, the projects, and meeting the lawyers and the artists and the webmasters and all the people who do the work that we support was just an incredible well, experience. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. At, in the front of our building is the Civil Rights Memorial designed by Ma Lynn, who did the Vietnam War Memorial, and she designed the whole Civil Rights Memorial and center that honors the 40 men, women, and children who, who died in the movement. Last question. Sorry about that. Yes. Uh, thank you for being here, Mr. Dees. Uh, I hear no mention of our Native American elders and our Native American people. Uh, you know, we have a country of immigrants, but uh, one of our greatest resources here are our Native people here. They are the original ecologists of this land, and uh, I hear no mention of them. I'm sorry, now you. I hear no mention uh, about our native people. Yeah, his question is, in my talk tonight, and, and I made no mention of Native Americans, uh, and that certainly is uh, probably the, the, the only indigenous people in this country. The rest of us, if you're not Native American, came from somewhere else. And it's certainly an issue. We've worked on some of those matters ourselves, and, um, and I didn't find an appropriate place to inject it here tonight, but. Uh, but certainly they're dear to our hearts. Thank you so much. But thank you. Do it and quick, because this is the last question. Yes, I will. Mr. Deese, thank you very much for being here. I have one question about an individual. When you say make a stand, that it's important for us to make a stand. As individuals, is there something in particular you can guide us toward to what is a good stand to take? Well, you say for justice when, at the end of your talk when you said we need to make a stand. My hearing aid, my hearing aid barriers went out. <laughs> what, what can each of us do to take a stand for justice? I think it's something you got to figure out for yourself. But I tell college students all the time, just look around. There are organizations that need your help. Elderly people are abused. Uh, the LGBT community has a need for people to uh, assist in things. Uh, people who are indigent or poor, who have housing issues. You just got to get out and get involved with people on the ground level. You can't start heading up some national organization. You got to do it that way. But thank you so much.